All right. Welcome, everyone, to the Hot Take of the Day podcast for this week's episode. We have Tom Lowry, who uh, I have been following on Twitter for quite some time. I first was introduced to him uh, on Bloomberg Television. And Tom has a very interesting background in oil and gas and an analytical tool that I'm going to get him to tell you about that I think really addresses the shale revolution, where we got to, and how we price securities in this crazy, crazy world. So Tom, first of all, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on the Hot Take of the Day podcast. How are you today? Thank you, David. Doing well. Um, And now, if I recall, you're in one of the Carolinas is where you're based out of. Yeah, I've serendipitously ended up in North Carolina. Uh, I'm a New York expat, and uh, I've been here for uh, about 18 years now. And, and how, how are you enjoying the lockdown? We had the, Jay Bryson, the chief economist, on for Wells Fargo a couple of weeks ago, and he's in North Carolina as well, and was talking about Tar Heels basketball and the restart of everything going on. It looks like South Carolina is more open than North Carolina. Is that a fair statement right now? Well, it seems like, and this is just uh, anecdotal, uh, it seems like last weekend really brought people out on uh, Franklin Street, um, so I think people are ready to get out there, um, but um, that's obviously a very sensitive topic. <laughs> yes, it is. Why don't Why don't you talk a little bit about your background and what brought you to North Carolina and uh, your experience in the oil and gas uh, investing world? Sure. So um, I started out in the late '90s as an energy banker uh, at Solomon Smith Barney Citigroup. Uh, and then uh, Credit Suisse after that. Um, and so this was at the very beginning of the shale revolution. We, we didn't think much about shale at that time. We had actually done one deal for uh, Mr. Mitchell, not knowing where that was all going to lead. Um, over the course of the next few years, I gravitated more to the very quantitative credit products and eventually ended up at a hedge fund uh, here in North Carolina trading convertible art. Uh, that turned into uh, a broad complex security strategy. And eventually, as the interest rate environment uh, forced us, we became more of a distress shop. Uh, all along the way, uh, I both managed uh, a portfolio of a uh, broad credit universe, so thinking broadly uh, about uh, economic issues and credit related issues. Um, but I also, I also continue to cover the oil and gas industry, which uh, became the largest part of uh, the high yield universe, and uh, obviously we've been through many uh, distress cycles with the industry at this point. And and so, if you compare the the early part, you know, let, let's use a two thousand eight example, perhaps with the financial crisis, or two thousand fourteen with the with the OPEC flood, and today, how do you see the three events as a distressed investor differently or similarly as they were at the time? Yeah, so I, I mean, it's it's bringing back a lot of nostalgia to ask that question. But we used to work on offshore a lot more, um, and that was a hit or miss kind of industry. Uh, even on the service side, contracts were hit or miss. Um, shale obviously brought a lot more consistency to what we were doing, um, and it really changed the game in terms of. Uh, going from kind of a statistical portfolio point of view to more of an asset focus point of view to really understand whether these assets were repeatable and homogenous uh, or if, you know, on, on the offshore side of things, uh, you know, does Davy Jones work out? <laughs> it's more of a binary sort of question. Right. So, so as we think about shale and, and one of the first interactions you and I had, I would say was maybe a year, year and a half ago. And we had talked about, uh, an investment pitch book that you had gone through New York in about Q1 of 2018. And I believe you called it the big short in oil and gas. Um, do you want to talk about that thesis? What got you there? And then what the sort of result of that was? Yeah, that's, um, that was kind of a turning point. So coming out of the 2016 distress cycle, I had developed uh, some uh, very involved tools to understand what we were investing in. And, and we did a good job in that. But I began to see that there were some key assumptions that um, 
were really going to lead to to problems. Um, the number one problem was well density and how it led to valuation. So everything that we do with Flow is a building block to valuation. It determines um, how management behaves. It determines how your investments work out. Look, this industry, you put money in the ground and you get money out of the ground. There's there's no other way. Um, and so eventually it catches up with you. It's not Facebook. It's not Google. Um, and so there was – once we started to constrain well performance in 20, uh, 2017, we really understood that density and the density assumptions that were baked into valuations were, um, were crazy and that it was going to lead to a problem. And by that, what I mean is um, – once we understood what a well for a company really produced, how many widgets it produced, the company itself is a combination of widgets times price times number of wells that produce widgets. And if you get that big multiplier wrong, the value of your company is wrong. Once you add debt to that, uh, the, the volatility uh, and, and all the management decisions that ensue um, – become problematic. Do you blame management? I mean, this is this is a topic that I know EFT's talked about a lot. I know it's been in the news a lot, but but to your point of the, the we're, we're widget makers, we're a, we're a net asset value business more so than a Google or a Netflix, and so you know they might they might implode catastrophically, but it, it's a commodity driven event like we just had that tends to lead to the demise of oil and gas during the cycles. And I'm I'm curious. Who you lay the blame at? I mean, I was certainly one who was skeptical of inventories uh, going back to 2014 in the Bakken, and it's really what led me away from the Bakken. And then you were there in 2017, and management teams sort of held the held the line and, and kept building debt. So who do you blame, Wall Street or management teams? Well, uh, both. And, uh, you know, I think in some cases – um, there are some management teams that I can be angry about at because I know um, because I, I had a supporting base of information and I know their message was different. But I think that the blame lays everywhere, and I think um, you know Wall Street has never been necessarily irresponsible to, to wanting to lose money, but the uh, the level of due diligence in this sector has to be greater in order to make good decisions and incentivize uh, management teams to commit capital uh, to the right projects and in the right quantities. Um, an example I'll give you is we took a backward-looking analysis over the last few years to say, would it have made a difference if, uh, if investors understood that they weren't getting paid at $50 a barrel? And so we took a, a bunch of uh, generic well forecasts across the Permian Basin and said, uh, we set a 40% IRR cutoff and a two and a half year payback because that's about when investors begin to get paid. Um, there's a difference between when, when the company has paid for the well and when the investors in the equity are getting paid. Um, and what we found was uh, about 2 billion barrels have been produced that were probably not helpful to shareholders. That equated to about a one and a half percent increase in global production. And I think in this business, we know that a 1% increase really drives the price of oil, right? Yeah. No decrease. And so if those companies had had more discipline to wait to 60 to $65, we certainly would have gotten there and been able to sustain it. Investors were never making money at 50 to $55. And I was on Bloomberg TV seven or eight months ago saying, if we hit $50, and this is before we got to $50, I said, we're going to have a real problem. Um, not only did we hit 50, but we went you know, negative. Now we're at 35. So if the investor who is giving management the capital understands that and can force it, we're going to end up in a much better place in the market. So, so let's, let's dive in a little bit on that because I think one of the, you know, companies would certainly say in the 50 to 55, they feel very healthy. And, and when you, when you looked at the, the 2 billion barrels being produced in the full costs, I assume you were including SG&A and interest and, and just all of the cost structure that's embedded in an oil and gas company. Is that right? That's right. So there's, there's a big difference between a well, when a well breaks even and when it's worth drilling it 
for shareholders. And um, I would argue that the people at the bottom of the stack who provide the riskiest capital, the equity, they need to get paid for their, for their capital and for that activity. So just because Wells can break even at $45 doesn't mean that the company is gaining ground. Do you think if you look forward coming out of this cycle and, and, and I want to talk about flow and, and what you built as sort of a result of this and, and the, the company that you, that you have to address this problem. But as you look forward to the next year or two, given the supply issues that we have and, and the different investment criteria of national oil companies and, and countries like Saudi Arabia and Nigeria, whose entire economies are based on oil. And then you look at the, the state of ESG and oil and gas companies in the United States. Do you think that the U.S. companies can compete for capital to be a participant in this market? And if so, at what price? And if so, at what price? How long does it take to get back there? Yeah, so and my message has been clear for a long time. Valuations are too high. And... The one way that we look at this industry is to say what oil price is being baked in to the value of the equities. So we can reverse engineer that just like you'd reverse engineer an option for implied ball. Um, and for too long, the price of oil has had a huge premium to the market. That's, the, the price of oil is baked into the securities. I still think that's the case. There's a lot of value out there. There's a lot of enterprise value out there, but we still need to price the entities for the downside node and the upside node. Um, so I'm not a doomer, it's not the end of the world. I recognize that we're gonna drill wells in the future at higher prices, but we still have to price in the downside node that we're experiencing now. So I don't think the valuations, especially right now in the large cap uh, side of things, um, the small cap side of things with the distress cycle that's about to take place, it gets a lot harder to figure out what, what you're really looking at because you don't know the capital structure right now. Um, and so I think there has to be a step where valuations still come down in, or, in order to incentivize capital. Um, in terms of competing for capital, the companies are gonna have to make a return for investors. And once that happens, um, we have, I, I think a lot of these discussion points uh, go away. So ESG, all the objections that we're having if the industry can produce 15% equity returns, um, a lot of people will flock to the industry. I mean, one of the benefits you have of uh, the energy industry is you're selling a commodity. There's always someone to buy what you're selling. Uh, you're not investing in something incredibly difficult to sell, like if you're developing a, a pharmaceutical. Um, this industry will be strong if it produces returns for investors. But in order to produce returns for investors, the price of the securities has to be more attractive. Yeah, and it's it's really interesting because we we both got to a, a very similar place. And and for those who've listened to or had been to a live speech of mine, really going back to September of 2019, where where I started doing speeches, I was very adamant that 95 percent of oil and gas companies were 50 to 100 percent overvalued. And, and then, you know, now prices have come off in some cases, 90% and people will call and they'll say, so do you feel good about investing in so-and-so? And I'm like, no, because at $35, fundamentally there isn't a value. And I don't know that that equity, if that's where you're investing, I don't know that that equity will survive the duration of time before. So the company might survive, but it will be the bondholders that hold it. And the question is then the discount. How do you, so, so talk about flow for me and, and what you built and, and what you were trying to do and, and who your primary customers are. Because I think that this is a really interesting investor driven tool. So, so flow is the product of um, hedge fund and distressed credit based valuation where what we've done is taken the building blocks, the mathematical building blocks of valuation that get you to cash flow and turn them into quality inputs. Um, so currently we have three products on the market. We forecast the base decline uh, of really all the companies in the universe. We've got about 70 companies that we forecast. This is a, a very opaque area where you don't get good information from companies. Um, Mark Papa of Centennial is 
Um, as you I, know, that's I was going to ask you that if he didn't raise it. I mean, it was unbelievable what he said on the conference call. And 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 so what did he say? I, everyone knows it now, right? Yeah, I, well, I think so. But I mean, he basically came out and an analyst said, hey, what's your base decline? And he said, that's sort of an entrapment question. We don't answer that. And it, that, that would sort of like be like Google saying, we don't we don't tell people how, how we make money would just just trust us. Right. Or, or a, a trucking company saying, we don't know the useful life of our of our chassis or something like that. Yeah, crazy. It's It's crazy. But the problem is, with a forward-looking statement, with the safe harbor, you're never going to get an accurate, repeatable answer. So when EOG gives you an answer, SM gives you an answer, there's no apples to apples. Uh, these answers are always very tricky because uh, the decline rates are high. Um, so we forecast that. So we need to know how the existing wells, our existing asset, which is also our collateral for our debtors, is declining to forecast that. That's the first piece of the puzzle. Um, and so we have a very large uh, AWS data science uh, infrastructure that creates those answers uh, for the industry. And that's, that's really the most difficult thing we do. It's uh, very highly quantitative, um, but I think that you know, from your experience in the sector, if, if you look forward a year and you need to know what percent of your asset is still going to be there. How, how do you think about, um, because, you know, for, for an unsophisticated investor, or for someone who doesn't have a tool, or even just for SEC, and, and you've probably seen me talk about this, obviously, I got caught similar to to what you said is, is I was not of the belief that coronavirus would lead to a shutdown anywhere outside of China. Um, so it, clearly wrong. Uh, I was also not of the belief that Saudi would uh, not defend the price. And then Russia took action against the U.S. oil and gas industry, which was predictable in hindsight, but I just didn't, I didn't recognize it. So I was positioned for a $60 world. And, you know, smog, which is the standardized measure of oil and gas and uses obviously reserve engineers valuations well by well with company input. So a little bit different than what you do. But yeah. that even even smogs were a suggesting companies were dramatically overvalued. But how do you think about what reserve engineers have been doing and the, the transparency of the fact that data is there and people ignored it versus what you're doing grinding into a well by well level independently? Yeah, so I, I don't know. I, I would say 10 years ago as an investor, I just stopped looking at that piece of paper stapled onto the back of the 10K because it wasn't helpful. Um, a reserve, and it's called an audit, but it's not really an audit. Uh, I know they're revered in the industry, but they were not helpful to me. This, begun, uh, th this issue began to come up um, more and more as we rolled out our products because people were saying that, doesn't this look a lot like what the reserve auditors are doing? And it's true, but we have machines that are running a repeatable process. And one of the things that, I, kind of side note that we had to accomplish to do this, we needed to make our results back test. We needed to say that this works. And the way we see that everything works is that we go in the past and we see how the wells decline and we see if, it, if, the, if the PVP, the base, matches our forecast. That's something the reserve auditors don't do. They don't produce that. They don't audit their audit. Um, they don't have repeatable processes. We don't know what goes into it. Some, uh, one example, there's an Appalachian producer with uh, tens of thousands, like 90,000 wells. Their reserve auditor uh, plugs an assumption into, it looks like PhD win of a terminal decline for all the wells. Um, so reserve auditors can be shocked. They can work on different assets. They can plug assumptions. Um, the, the, there's a huge agency risk problem. Um, there's very little accountability, um, but they're held in high regard. I don't know how they use technology. I don't know why we beat them all the time. Uh, we come up with lower reserves. Uh, we know in some cases that they get a better look into the cost structure than we do. Um, so I don't know. I, as an investor, it doesn't help me. Um, 
and I would go so far as to say I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't trust it either. That's I mean it's 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 fair and and again I mean I think that the other key point is the overlay of price and and that's why I think our industry is so simple is that you have a number of wells a production curve and an overlay of price and cost structure and there's a value and okay. so so I think back to Q1 2018 when you were going around New York sort of telling some Wall Street firms that you you think that most companies are overvalued and and I think the way you described it is they they sort of laughed you out of the room and I'm interested to see your perspective of how Wall Street and firms value things, which clearly you were right. I mean, clearly you were you, like the best investment since 2018 would have been to short any oil and gas company, even if you exclude coronavirus. So I'm curious as you think about the structure and the incentives on Wall Street to make choices. And as you look at maybe the S&P trading at 3000 today, how you think about the doomers that everyone yells down and shouts down and then when they turn out to be right, they're like anti-heroes. I'm, I'm curious here. Well, yeah, and I, I don't want to end up in that camp because I've actually, I've done much better on the long side in my career. Um, but where I think the market is going that it's not now, and I, I think that, um, you know, we may be early in this, but the use of quantitative methods to understand fundamentals is something that's just developing now. It's, it's very early in, Every industry, many companies don't, large companies don't even know who their biggest customer is. And so when you look at like uh, Salesforce and their acquisition of Tableau and all these new data related products, everyone is scrambling to understand uh, what the underlying data is telling them. Um, my observation about the financial industry in general is that it's very slow to move. Um, we tend to trust people who have made good decisions in the past, um, but we're on the next, uh, the next wave of being able to understand fundamentals. I think um, 25 years ago, we were beginning to understand securities, and guys like Ken Griffin were able to figure out the price of an option in their heads and trade on it, and then build models, and then beat everybody, and then the models got built. And then hedge funds no longer produced much of a return, but we got stuck in this business of these are the decision makers. I think everyone now is developing new tools. Um, several years ago, sitting behind my Bloomberg doing things the same old way, when I heard that people were flying drones over JCPenney to trade the CDS, my mind was blown. They were gonna beat me. Um, and these external data sets tell us more about the fundamentals than the financial statements do. That's where we are now, and it's a huge problem to conquer, but it's, it's new to the street. Um, when I took it out there, you know, the question was, who the hell are you? And it was like, this is great as long as you're telling me someone else's investment is gonna perform poorly. And the minute I said, well, yours is gonna perform poorly too, and you should be aware of that, I was shown the elevator. So, I, the, the quantitative methods will be shown to be correct, but they're very hard to produce. They take years to get good results. It's been uh, two years in development for our results to really get fine-tuned. Um, but tools like these were not available. So there are a lot of engineering tools on the market for oil and gas. Um, billions of dollars worth of companies are out there. But nobody solved this problem for the investor because we can look back now and say, what a half a trillion dollars was lost in the last year. So if everybody knew that, that wouldn't have happened. Right. So how do you think the industry then, you know, if you, if you separate the investors from the industry, I mean, there's sort of a, a, a uh, it's sort of a circular argument in that the investors will do will invest if the companies do the right thing, but the companies will do the right thing if the investors control the capital. So I'm curious in that do loop, how how you think that we come out of this? And and I know that your your tool isn't really built around consolidation, but you must have views of consolidation vis a vis the current price and forward strip. What, what, how do you think that yeah. the next well, year think plays out? Yeah, so I think maybe drawing more from my credit background, there, there are some difficulties in consolidation because we have a lot of stakeholders. One of the problems we created is we're gonna have, we have a lot of unsecured shareholder and stakeholders out there right now, um, both uh, bond holders and equity holders. 
and we're going to create whole tranches of new stakeholders in this process. I mean, um, your guys at Centennial opened up a third lane bucket, right? Yeah. So all these lien holder buckets are going to be filled up and getting agreement on these stakeholders is going to be very difficult. So I don't see a direct route through the bankruptcy cycle to consolidation. Um, I also don't necessarily see the argument that smooshing two companies together makes them better. Um, the, the problem with that is you're going to cleave off half of the assets that aren't as good as the other half. Um, a good example of this would be um, Roan and Citizen in the merge where they smooshed the companies together and immediately they dropped half of the rig, the total rig count. So those wells don't get drilled, that, that cash flow never comes to investors if the wells don't get drilled. Um, Consolidation is not always the problem. Identifying good assets is the problem. No, it's it is interesting though because I, I would I would push back a little on the consolidation and and I certainly agree with you that the number of stakeholders and quite frankly the price deck makes it extraordinarily hard for them to merge. But if they don't merge, their cost structures because they're not drilling anyway. Because to your point, below fifty or fifty five, it's not economic to really burn inventory. So then you're sitting around waiting two years and paying G and A and paying interest and paying all these costs where. If you smash assets together, there is an NPV accretion of a forward strip that's substantially higher. Yeah, and, and this is where I just want to be careful about those numbers. In, in some cases, yeah, the GNA makes a difference. In some cases, the GNA doesn't make a difference. And so you just have to be very diligent about those numbers and calculate them all the way through to say, in these cases, it matters. In these cases, that's not the material lever. How how would you how would you if if you were speaking to employees out there who are considering like what's going to happen to my company? We're not running any rigs. We don't have any frac spreads. I don't know if I'm going to get laid off. What 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 magnitude of numbers are you talking about? Like, is it a dollar per barrel GNA? Is it a, a, a inventory? Is it a size? How how do you qualitatively assess that? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a highly variable question. Um, it, you know, a lot of that GNA is coming out of the C-suite, um, but yeah, I, I mean, that's almost too big of a question to boil down. No, that's fair. That's fair. It's and and, and our, our approach is always to turn into uh, discrete cash flows. Um, so, you know, hard to extrapolate the thematic. When, when you look at the, the level of um, expectation exuberance, if I can coin a phrase, and, and you think about oil versus gas or Bakken versus Eagleford or versus Permian, in your work, did you see any, any real bias towards certain plays or certain asset types or certain, certain company types, or was it pretty much across the board uh, the yeah, same? Yeah, and in... In my hedge fund days, that was always the, the question to figure out. What does everyone believe and where are they wrong? Um, and so there was clearly a bias toward the Permian. Uh, one of the ways I would sort of present that so that everyone can understand it is we can look back and say, we'll look back at old sell side research and there is an EBITDA multiple premium for the Permian. But what we have are a collection of oil wells. There's there's no difference in EBIT, the EBITDA of oil coming from the Permian and EBITDA coming from the Bakken. Uh, once we figure out what the cash flows are, what the differentials are, it's all the same. Um, and so using multiples has its own problems, but the, the Permian pr premium, um, yeah, it, it clearly existed at that point in time. I was actually focused on Hainesville gas because I thought people cared the least about it. Um, and so that's sort of that, as a value focused investor where you want to be. Now there are a lot of people that run strategies that take uh, momentum into account and other factors and they do great with that. Um, we'll, I would just kind of side note, I, we don't approach this as saying our uh, investment biases need to be used by anyone else. I think there are a lot of really good investors out there that do things different ways. We just have really good inputs. 
do you, do you, are you seeing in terms of clientele? Are you seeing a big pickup from any segment of the of the sector, whether it's distressed credit or PE or hedges or you know, as people are starting to do diligence, are, are they now finding your tool and saying, hey, you know what, there really was a bust. I want incremental data. Where where are you seeing the trend in that market? Yeah, I I think that so first of all, we're a young company, so these are all trends. Um, and so, um, you know, even a, just a few months ago when we weren't in this cycle, uh, our, our predominant customer was uh, the long short investor who uh, wanted highly detailed information. Uh, that drifted more into the credit investor who said, I can't make a mistake. And now we're getting calls from the distressed community saying, we could end up owning this thing for a long time. We could have free fall bankruptcies. Um, and we're about to hire a financial advisor and an engineering firm and pay them $5 million. And guess what? The last person who paid them was the company. And what we hear over and over again is we need a baseline. And so that's, that is the biggest recent trend. And I would say that's a 30 day kind of trend. But as we see more bankruptcies, we think we're going to see more people coming to us looking to understand the numbers in uh, what we would call an unbiased way. Um, let the machines run, and if your engineering firm uh, who's previously worked for your defaulted company and plans to work for them again, gives you another number, have them explain it. When, when you think about all of the things you've seen over the last 15 years that, that maybe mistakes made or, or things you know, things you would tell your younger self that might have prepared you for, let's say this time, is there any, is there any big learnings that you've had in your career that just have really stuck with you and helped, helped build the character that you are? Well, I, I guess the, the biggest thing is, is good things don't just happen to you in, in the investing world. Um, the, the, where you are blindsided and where you're naive you can get lucky sometimes and feel like you have good intuition, but it always catches up with you. And no one's ever gonna come and uh, bail your position out. Um, from time to time, you might get lucky, but it doesn't happen often. And so doing the fundamental work, I, I, I think is the most important uh, lesson that I learned. Do you, as you re reflect on some of the consolidation that happened last year in that time frame, did, did you assess them or, or have you had investors come in and ask for relative value assessments as to whether, you know, and I'm not going to ask you to comment on the specific deals, but like the Parsley Jagged deal as an example, the Cal and Carrizo deal as an example, the PDC SRC deal as an example, yeah. in terms of the relative value and how you would gauge like as a scorecard, if the management made the right decision for the right assumptions at the time. Yeah, and, and, and guess what I'm gonna say? It all comes down to valuation and cash flow. So um, our, I think our most recent example is WPX and Felix. Um, in the case of WPX, um, one of our products is, is a large evaluation tool where we started to have fund managers come to us and say, I wanna see who's good and who's bad, who's getting better and who's getting worse, and I wanna know that in 10 minutes. Which is, which is a very difficult problem, and it's something that we solve because we, we forecast all the wells in the business. Um, we've been able to do that through a series of data visualizations. So for some period of time, we were watching WPX's uh, um, state line area, Northern Reeves, Delaware Basin, go from being a highly productive asset that was making people happy. WPX was definitely a Wall Street darling. Uh, but we were seeing that asset produce uh, lower uh, oil recoveries. And typically, um, for a good asset, you know, what would, what would that tell you? That they're, they've drilled too tight and that their inventory is, is lower than they expect. So, bingo. You see that trend and then uh, you're, at, at, as a public company, at, you know, you're going to get this right. What's the next thing they do? They, they have to buy someone to cover up the sins. Mm -hmm. so, so we knew that there was a use of capital coming for WPX. And 
Um, when the Felix deal got announced, we were able to say, uh, we saw this coming and they actually bought a good asset. In a lot of cases, it's either deal making or uh, geographic convenience, closeology. We see a lot of deals that, you know, poor assets get purchased. Uh, we were very quickly able to see that um, you know, Felix was a highly productive asset that had a low base decline. And the next morning, uh, and we were able to value the asset overnight. The next morning, the company starts talking about slow backing their wells, or WPX is talking about Felix slow backing their wells. We're able to say, yep, we see those characteristics uh, in the aggregate production. And uh, we see uh, some changes coming in the next year because of the completion, um, it, what we expect out of completions and a number of completions we expect. And so we're able to put a number on that. Um, and that's the whole point because when the stock opens in the morning, you need to be ready to trade. Well, and, and I mean, it, what was so interesting about this time frame, and, and I can't remember exactly if it was December or January when WPX announced the deal. I know they closed in March, but I mean, their stock went from roughly 10 bucks a share to 14 a share. And, and it is so interesting to think about the the first two months of this year even in spite of the demand destruction in china of as much as three million barrels a day the companies were doing very well and and all of a sudden this demand change overlaid this black cloud on the industry that that even it took it away from fundamentals do you struggle talking with investors that they're like cool i love that you've done all this technical work and you have ai and you can solve all my problems but like unless you can tell me that oil is is going to be higher than 35 in the next six months and and or or lower or whatever i don't really care because i can't i can't invest in a sector with with a commodity substantially below the cost of replacement Right. So first of all, the sector is not for everybody. Um, and it, it, if you're not going as an investor, if you're not going to go to the trouble to understand really the second derivative in the business, the convexity with respect to the price of oil, you're not going to do a good job. So it, it's, it's not for everyone. It's a hard industry to, to trade. What we really, what you need to do to be successful is to understand when the price of oil goes up, Will your company outperform the price of oil? So will your company create value? On the way down, will you preserve value? Um, and so it's a classic uh, options valuation question. Um, and we can start to think about these components in options terms. Your, your base decline is your, your theta, the, the time that's passing with your option. Um, but that's, you know, I, and I, and I do believe that there's not, uh, capital still has to come out of the sector to get the valuations right. Now, we're also going to have to at the same time shift capital around because of the stress cycle. So it's going to be a sloppy process. Um, but if, uh, if you're of the mindset that the price of oil is always going to be the price of oil, well, I think you're wrong. We don't need to get into that conversation. But probably investing in oil and gas is not for you. In, in terms of if, if someone wanted to use a flat price deck from today and didn't have a context, that, that's not the right. Is that, is that what you meant? Oh, uh, you know, perhaps. Um, I, I think then we get into the, the conversation of what, uh, of when, when people want to use uh, strip and, and say that they're going to somehow hedge returns, what the, what the real factors are around that, whether you capture all those cash flows. Um, and, and that's not really the case, but I think that everybody that works in this sector has some sort of view on the future price of the commodity. Um, to say that I need companies that are gonna make a lot of money just at this price and I expect no volatility. Um, most of those people don't dabble in the sector in the first place. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that. And, and I know a lot of people, again, because it's so nuanced and I don't know, I don't follow other sectors as closely. Obviously, I've, I've worked 20 years in, in in oil and gas in particular, and I'm always shocked at like when when I 
when I say it is very hard to invest right now, the rig count will fall to below 200 and the frack spread will stay below 50 because oil is 35. But those dynamics will lead to supply reductions, which will lead to price increases. And it's only a function of time. And then people say, well, okay, well, oil is going back to 60. That's great. And I'm like, well, if it takes three years, it's not great. And if it takes three days, it's really great. Yeah, um, you, you, you bring up a, a concept that I hear a lot um, to to maybe like really drive into what you're getting at. I hear the term uninvestable frequently. The sector is uninvestable. Well, what makes it uninvestable? Um, I'd say on the credit side, the first thing that makes it uninvestable is covenants. So we have a passive market structure that's uh, driven by um, passive credit investors who don't demand covenants. We went through this in 2014 and 2015. Uh, there's, there's a permitted lien swap in just about uh, every uh, oil and gas company that lets them take on more debt so you can be constantly pushed down below senior creditors. Um, that never changed, even though the market took huge losses on it. So the first reason that it's uninvestable is because of market structure. The second reason I'd say that the that people say the sector is uninvestable is because they don't understand the dynamics of valuation, what the base decline is, what a well is going to produce, and how many places you have to drill. Um, you don't get that from going to an oil and gas conference. You don't get it from a one-on-one -on -one management. You don't get it from a slide deck. Um, you have to dig that information up on your own, and it's tough, which is why we do it. But those getting to why things are uninvestable um, look, if there are securities out there, someone owns them, someone's invested in them, they're either going to be right or wrong, they're going to go up or down. Um, so when, when I hear uninvestable, I usually want to know why. Yeah, well, and, and, and I think that that description is exactly, is exactly right. And um, I, I share your view and, and have for a long time that the ESG push, notwithstanding the fact that there was, but there's some G issues more than even the E and the S. But then on top of that, when a stock is fundamentally overvalued 50 or 100% and you're sitting with management and you say, I can't invest in you. And then in brackets, because you're overvalued by 100% and I don't want to be short because then people hate me and won't talk to me. So you say I can't invest in you in ESG. And I agree with you that if, if you had Concho trading at $7 a share, as an example, not investment advice, there would be a lot of people who'd come in and say, hey, I love I love that stock at seven bucks. I don't care what they do. Yeah, and, and to maybe wander off of what you just said, you, you made me think of an example a few years ago where we had been through uh, the credit cycle with Resolute. Um, they had put second lien debt in and they actually pulled out of their tailspin by drilling some great wells in Reeves County. Uh, which really transformed the company. Very quickly, the stock traded from like $2 a share to $20 a share. So even though that they were drilling wells that were IPing at 1,500, 2,000 barrels a day, with granted with pretty wide spacing, um, what, was, what was that $20 stock pricing in? And every time the stock traded up, the stock was really pricing in more repeatability of those excellent wells. Um, and you could express that in the wells per section, how many wells were gonna go into a square mile. And when we backed that number out, it started out as eight, became 12, became 18, became 24. And what did management have to do? They had 20,000 acres. They had to drill a 24 well per section pad in their, in their best piece of rock. And it didn't go well. Um, now they got very lucky and they got taken out before the, the wells in the center of that pattern were completed. Um, but that was going to deflate, uh, I think really the entire Reeves story. If you saw that um, in the, it, along the river that you couldn't do 24 wells per section. Um, at that point in time, you know, all, all we saw were gun barrel diagrams saying we can drill 24, I think Diamondback was saying 50 wells per section, and Kana claimed to actually have drilled a 60 well cube, which never happened. Um, so that density story, um, management went and did it, is I guess my point here, 
because they were forced to do it by the valuation of their stock. Um, now, how many times did they put the drill bit in and waste money when they could have drilled 12 wells per section instead of 24? Uh, a lot. So there was a lot of capital burn because of the expectation put on them by their valuation. And, 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 you know, and that, I think that's a great place for us to kind of close the conversation because I think as you tie in the oil and gas world and the technical work you do, it does all come down to inventory. And I, I, I think that the part that is missed is that companies for a long time to justify valuations or justify pay packages or justify anything were suggesting there were way more wells to drill than there actually were. And when I look at inventory in the Bakken, when I look at inventory in the Eagleford, when I look at the regulatory environments in Colorado, when I look at the cost structure in the Powder River Basin, there's really only the Permian. And I would say in the Permian, unless they were drilling more than eight to 900 feet apart in all their wells, they were, it was way too tight. And so even if oil were to go back to 60, the reason I have trouble with investment in oil in the US today, notwithstanding some of the moving the, the, the chairs on the Titanic, is not because I don't believe in oil, it's because there just isn't enough inventory for most people to survive long enough to have a meaningful investment structure, which is why I sort of have pivoted to gas in terms of where the future is and, and that that dynamic in our industry is going to be very interesting yeah. in the next five years. Do you agree with that? I, well, I think there are a lot of locations left to drill. Um, I don't think all the companies have all the locations. Um, and there's a second problem. If we're going to go through this 30 to $40 period and, and companies, you know, let's say we get back to $40 and companies start drilling again. They're just wasting their locations. They're wasting their locations while their existing cash flow burns down. Um, and so they're destroying value. Um, so I think that has to be a, a much more capital conscious decision. Yeah. And that, that, that does belie a very, uh, a very slow recovery. Um, personally, what, what do you do for fun when you're not uh, solving the problems of valuation on gas? <laughs> Well, I've got three little kids and I like to play golf. So um, try to fit that in with uh, running a startup that's uh, producing new software for user sets of testing every day. Uh, it's been a crazy couple of years. Um, but uh, here in North Carolina, we do get to play golf just about all year round. For those who are listening that want uh, to chat with you or, or find out more about the software, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Yeah, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, our website is flowoilwell.com and uh, I'm on Twitter with my real name as well. Um, and a lot of people contact me there, especially if you, uh, if you don't want me to know your identity before we have an initial chat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Tom, I really appreciate you joining us. Uh, I, I think a lot of learnings there in terms of the diligence and maybe what, what people could be doing better um, either, either in their personal life. Do the diligence, do the work. There's no such thing as a, as a free lunch. Um, so thank you so much for joining. You got it. Thank you for having me, David. So uh, as always, guys, if you want to uh, keep the hot take of the day on the air and grow the, user, the uh, listenership, you can subscribe on any of the podcast sites that you do, write a review. You can contact me at drw at hottakeoftheday.com. And until next time, be safe, be good, have a great day, and bye for now.